Orlando, a biography. Novel by Virginia Woolf. Chapter 5. The great cloud which hung, not only over London, but over the whole of the British Isles on the first day of the 19th century stayed, or rather, did not stay, for it was buffeted about constantly by blustering gales, long enough to have extraordinary consequences upon those who lived beneath its shadow. A change seemed to have come over the climate of England. Rain fell frequently, but only in fitful gusts, which were no sooner over than they began again. The sun shone, of course, but it was so girt about with clouds and the air was so saturated with water that its beams were discolored in purples, oranges, and reds of a dull sort took the place of the more positive landscapes of the 18th century. Under this bruised and sullen canopy the green of the cabbages was less intense, and the white of the snow was muddied. But what was worse, damp now began to make its way into every house damp, which is the most insidious of all enemies. For while the sun can be shut out by blinds, and the frost roasted by a hot fire, damp steals in while we sleep, damp is silent, imperceptible, ubiquitous. Damp swells the wood, furs the kettle, rusts the iron, rots the stone. So gradual is the process, that it is not until we pick up some chest of drawers, or coal scuttle, and the whole thing drops to pieces in our hands, that we suspect even that the disease is at work. Thus, stealthily and imperceptibly, none marking the exact day or hour of the change, the constitution of England was altered and nobody knew it. Everywhere the effects were felt. The hardy country gentleman, who had sat down gladly to a meal of ale and beef in a room designed, perhaps by the brothers Adam, with classic dignity, now felt chilly. Rugs appeared, beards were grown, trousers were fastened tight under the instep. The chill which he felt in his legs the country gentleman soon transferred to his house, furniture was muffled, walls and tables were covered, nothing was left bare. Then a change of diet became essential. The muffin was invented in the crumpet. Coffee supplanted the after-dinner port, and, as coffee led to a drawing-room in which to drink it, and a drawing-room to glass cases, and glass cases to artificial flowers, and artificial flowers to mantelpieces, and mantelpieces to pianofortes, and pianofortes to drawing-room ballads, and drawing-room ballads, skipping a stage or two, to innumerable little dogs, mats, and china ornaments, the home which had become extremely important was completely altered. Outside the house it was another effect of the damp ivy grew in unparalleled profusion. Houses that had been of bare stone were smothered in greenery. No garden, however formal its original design, lacked a shrubbery, a wilderness, a maze. What light penetrated to the bedrooms where children were born was naturally of an obvious green, and what light penetrated to the drawing rooms where grown men and women lived came through curtains of brown and purple plush. But the change did not stop at outward things. The damp struck within. Men felt the chill in their hearts, the damp in their minds. In a desperate effort to snuggle their feelings into some sort of warmth one subterfuge was tried after another. Love, birth, and death were all swaddled in a variety of fine phrases. The sexes drew further and further apart. No open conversation was tolerated. Evasions and concealments were sedulously practiced on both sides. And just as the ivy and the evergreen rioted in the damp earth outside, so did the same fertility show itself within. The life of the average woman was a succession of childbirths. She married at 19 and had 15 or 18 children by the time she was 30, for twins abounded. Thus the British Empire came into existence, and thus for there is no stopping damp, it gets into the ink pot as it gets into the woodwork sentences swelled, adjectives multiplied, lyrics became epics, and little trifles that had been essays a column long were now encyclopedias in 10 or 20 volumes. But Eusebius Chubb shall be our witness to the effect this all had upon the mind of a sensitive man who could do nothing to stop it. There is a passage towards the end of his memoirs where he describes how, after writing 35 folio pages one morning all about nothing he screwed the lid of his ink pot and went for a turn in his garden. Soon he found himself involved in the shrubbery. Innumerable leaves creaked and glistened above his head. He seemed to himself to crush the mold of a million more under his feet. Thick smoke exuded from a damp bonfire at the end of the garden. He reflected that no fire on earth could ever hope to consume that vast vegetable encumbrance. Wherever he looked, vegetation was rampant. Cucumbers came scrolloping across the grass to his feet. Giant cauliflowers towered deck above deck till they rivaled, to his disordered imagination, the elm trees themselves. Hence laid incessantly eggs of no special tint. Then, remembering with a sigh his own fecundity and his poor wife Jane, now in the throes of her fifteenth confinement indoors, 
how, he asked himself, could he blame the fowls? He looked upwards into the sky. Did not heaven itself, or that great frontispiece of heaven, which is the sky, indicate the ascent, indeed, the instigation of the heavenly hierarchy? For there, winter or summer, year in year out, the clouds turned and tumbled, like whales. He pondered, or elephants rather, but no, there was no escaping the simile which was pressed upon him from a thousand airy acres, the whole sky itself as it spread wide above the British Isles was nothing but a vast feather bed, and the undistinguished fecundity of the garden, the bedroom and the hen roost was copied there. He went indoors, wrote the passage quoted above, laid his head in a gas oven, and when they found him later he was past revival. While this went on in every part of England, it was all very well for Orlando to mew herself in her house at Blackfriars and pretend that the climate was the same, that one could still say what one liked and wear knee breeches or skirts as the fancy took one. Even she, at length, was forced to acknowledge that times were changed. One afternoon in the early part of the century she was driving through St. James's Park in her old panelled coach when one of those sunbeams, which occasionally, though not often, managed to come to earth, struggled through, marbling the clouds with strange prismatic colours as it passed. Such a sight was sufficiently strange after the clear and uniform skies of the 18th century to cause her to pull the window down and look at it. The pews and flamingo clouds made her think with a pleasurable anguish, which proves that she was insensibly afflicted with the damp already of dolphins dying in Ionian seas. But what was her surprise when, as it struck the earth, the sunbeam seemed to call forth, or to light up, a pyramid, hecatomb, or trophy, for it had something of a banquet table air, a conglomeration at any rate of the most heterogeneous and ill-assorted objects. Pile tickledy piggledy in a vast mound where the statue of Queen Victoria now stands. Draped about a vast cross of fretted and floriated gold were widow's weeds and bridal veils, hooked onto other excrescences were crystal palaces, bassinets, military helmets, memorial wreaths, trousers, whiskers, wedding cakes, cannon, Christmas trees, telescopes, extinct monsters, globes, maps, elephants, and mathematical instruments the whole supported like a gigantic coat of arms on the right side by a female figure clothed in flowing white on the left by a portly gentleman wearing a frock coat and sponge bag trousers. The incongruity of the objects, the association of the fully clothed and the partly draped, the garishness of the different colors and their plaid-like juxtapositions afflicted Orlando with the most profound dismay. She had never, in all her life, seen anything at once so indecent, so hideous, and so monumental. It might, and indeed it must be. The effect of the sun on the waterlogged air it would vanish with the first breeze that blew, but for all that, it looked, as she drove past, as if it were destined to endure forever. Nothing, she felt, sinking back into the corner of her coach, no wind, rain, sun, or thunder, could ever demolish that garish erection. Only the noses would model and the trumpets would rust, but there they would remain, pointing east, west, south, and north, eternally. She looked back as her coach swept up Constitution Hill. Yes, there it was, still beaming placidly in a light which she pulled her watch out of her fob was, of course, the light of twelve o'clock midday. None other could be so prosaic, so matter-of-fact, so impervious to any hint of dawn or sunset, so seemingly calculated to last forever. She was determined not to look again. Already she felt the tides of her blood run sluggishly. But what was more peculiar a blush, vivid and singular overspread her cheeks as she passed Buckingham Palace and her eyes seemed forced by a superior power down upon her knees. Suddenly she saw with a start that she was wearing black breeches. She never ceased blushing till she had reached her country house, which, considering the time it takes four horses to trot thirty miles, will be taken, we hope, as a signal proof of her chastity. Once there, she followed what had now become the most imperious need of her nature and wrapped herself as well as she could in a damask quilt which she snatched from her bed. She explained to the widow Bartholomew, who had succeeded good old Grimstitch's housekeeper, that she felt chilly. So do we all, milady, said the widow, heaving a profound sigh. The walls is sweating, she said, with a curious, lugubrious complacency, and sure enough, she had only to lay her hand on the oak panels for the fingerprints to be marked there. The ivy had grown so profusely that many windows were now sealed up. The kitchen was so dark that they could scarcely tell a kettle from a colander. A poor black cat had been mistaken for coals and shoveled on the fire. Most of the maids were already wearing three or four red flannel petticoats, though the month was August. But is it true, milady, 
the good woman asked, hugging herself, while the golden crucifix heaped on her bosom, that the queen, bless her, is wearing a what do you call it, a, eh? the good woman hesitated and blushed. A crinoline, Orlando helped her out with it, for the word had reached Blackfriars. Mrs. Bartholomew nodded. The tears were already running down her cheeks, but as she wept she smiled. For it was pleasant to weep. Were they not all of them weak women? Wearing crinolines the better to conceal the fact, the great fact, the only fact, but, nevertheless, the deplorable fact. Which every modest woman did her best to deny until denial was impossible, the fact that she was about to bear a child. To bear fifteen or twenty children indeed, so that most of a modest woman's life was spent, after all, in denying what, on one day at least of every year, was made obvious. The muffins is keepin' not, said Mrs. Bartholomew mopping up her tears, in the library. And wrapped in a damask bed quilt, to a dish of muffins Orlando now sat down. The muffins is keepin' not in the library Orlando minced out the horrid cockney phrase in Mrs. Bartholomew's refined cockney accents as she drank but no, she detested the mild fluid her tea. It was in this very room, she remembered, that Queen Elizabeth had stood astride the fireplace with a flag and a beer in her hand which she suddenly dashed on the table when Lord Berkeley tactlessly used the imperative instead of the subjunctive. Little man, little man, comma, Orlando could hear her say as must a word to be addressed to princes? And down came the flagon on the table, there was the mark of it still. But when Orlando leapt to her feet, as the mere thought of that great queen commanded, the bed quilt tripped her up, and she fell back in her armchair with a curse. Tomorrow she would have to buy twenty yards or more of black bombazine, she supposed, to make a skirt. And then, here she blushed, she would have to buy a crinoline. And then, here she blushed, a bassinet, and then another crinoline, and so on, the blushes came and went with the most exquisite iteration of modesty and shame imaginable. One might see the spirit of the age blowing, now hot, now cold, upon her cheeks. And if the spirit of the age blew a little unequally, the crinoline being blushed for before the husband, her ambiguous position must excuse her, even her sex was still in dispute and the irregular life she had lived before. At length the color on her cheeks resumed its stability and it seemed as if the spirit of the age if such indeed it were lay dormant for a time. Then Orlando felt in the bosom of her shirt as if for some locket or relic of lost affection, and drew out no such thing, but a roll of paper, sea-stained, blood-stained, travel-stained the manuscript of her poem, The Oak Tree. She had carried this about with her for so many years now, and in such hazardous circumstances, that many of the pages were stained, some were torn, while the straits she had been in for writing paper when with the gypsies, had forced her to overscore the margins and cross the lines till the manuscript looked like a piece of darning most conscientiously carried out. She turned back to the first page and read the date, 1586, written in her own boyish hand. She had been working at it for close three hundred years now. It was time to make an end. Meanwhile she began turning and dipping and reading and skipping and thinking as she read. How very little she had changed all these years. She had been a gloomy boy, in love with death, as boys are, and then she had been amorous and florid, and then she had been sprightly and satirical, and sometimes she had tried prose and sometimes she had tried drama. Yet through all these changes she had remained, she reflected, fundamentally the same. She had the same brooding meditative temper, the same love of animals and nature, the same passion for the country and the seasons. After all, she thought, getting up and going to the window, nothing has changed. The house, the garden are precisely as they were. Not a chair has been moved, not a trinket sold. There are the same walks, the same lawns, the same trees, and the same pool, which, I dare say, has the same carp in it. True, Queen Victoria is on the throne and not Queen Elizabeth, but what difference? No sooner had the thought taken shape, than, as if to rebuke it, the door was flung wide and in marched basket, the butler, followed by Bartholomew, the housekeeper, to clear away tea. Orlando, who had just dipped her pen in the ink, and was about to indict some reflection upon the eternity of all things, was much annoyed to be impeded by a blot, which spread and meandered round her pen. It was some infirmity of the quill, she supposed, it was split or dirty. She dipped it again. The blot increased. She tried to go on with what she was saying, no words came. Next she began to decorate the blot with wings and whiskers, till it became a round-headed monster, something between a bat and a wombat. But as for writing poetry with Basket and Bartholomew in the room, it was impossible. No sooner had she said impossible than, 
To her astonishment and alarm, the pen began to curve and caracole with the smoothest possible fluency. Her page was written in the neatest sloping Italian hand with the most insipid verse she had ever read in her life. I am myself but a vile link. A midlife's weary chain. But I have spoken hallowed words. Oh, do not say in vain. Will the young maiden, when her tears. Alone in moonlight shine. Tears for the absent and the loved. Murmur. She wrote without a stop as Bartholomew and Basket grunted and groaned about the room, mending the fire, picking up the muffins. Again she dipped her pen and off it went. She was so changed, the soft carnation cloud. Once mantling o'er her cheek like that which Eve. Hangs o'er the sky, glowing with roseate hue. Had faded into paleness, broken by. Bright burning blushes, torches of the tomb. But here, by an abrupt movement she spilt the ink ever the page and blotted it from human sight she hoped forever. She was all of a quiver, all of a stew. Nothing more repulsive could be imagined than to feel the ink flowing thus in cascades of involuntary inspiration. What had happened to her? Was it the damp? Was it Bartholomew? Was it Basket? What was it? She demanded. But the room was empty. No one answered her, unless the dripping of the rain in the ivy could be taken for an answer. Meanwhile, she became conscious, as she stood at the window, of an extraordinary tingling and vibration all over her as if she were made of a thousand wires upon which some breeze or errant fingers were playing scales. Now her toes tingled, now her marrow. She had the queerest sensations about the thigh bones. Her hair seemed to erect themselves. Her arms sang and twanged as the telegraph wires would be singing and twanging in twenty years or so. But all this agitation seemed at length to concentrate in her hands. And then in one hand, and then in one finger of that hand and then finally to contract itself so that it made a ring of quivering sensibility about the second finger of the left hand. And when she raised it to see what caused this agitation, she saw nothing nothing but the vast solitary emerald which Queen Elizabeth had given her. And was that not enough? she asked. It was of the finest water. It was worth ten thousand pounds at least. The vibration seemed, in the oddest way, but remember we are dealing with some of the darkest manifestations of the human soul, to say no. That is not enough, and, further, to assume a note of interrogation, as though it were asking, what did it mean, this hiatus, this strange oversight? Till poor Orlando felt positively ashamed of the second finger of her left hand without in the least knowing why. At this moment, Bartholomew came in to ask which dress she should lay out for dinner, and Orlando, whose senses were much quickened, instantly glanced at Bartholomew's left hand and instantly perceived what she had never noticed before a thick ring of rather jaundiced yellow circling the third finger where her own was bare. Let me look at your ring, Bartholomew, she said, stretching her hand to take it. At this, Bartholomew made as if she had been struck in the breast by a rogue. She started back a pace or two, clenched her hand and flung it away from her with a gesture that was noble in the extreme. No, she said, with resolute dignity, her ladyship might look if she pleased but as for taking off her wedding ring, not the Archbishop nor the Pope nor Queen Victoria on her throne could force her to do that. Her Thomas had put it on her finger twenty-five years, six months, three weeks ago, she had slept in it, worked in it, washed in it, prayed in it, and proposed to be buried in it. In fact, Orlando understood her to say, but her voice was much broken with emotion, that it was by the gleam on her wedding ring that she would be assigned her station among the angels and its luster would be tarnished forever if she let it out of her keeping for a second. Heaven help us, said Orlando, standing at the window and watching the pigeons at their pranks, what a world we live in. What a world to be sure. Its complexities amazed her. It now seemed to her that the whole world was ringed with gold. She went into dinner. Wedding rings abounded. She went to church. Wedding rings were everywhere. She drove out. Gold, or pinchbeck, thin, thick, plain, smooth, they glowed dully on every hand. Rings filled the jeweler's shops, not the flashing pastes and diamonds of Orlando's recollection. But simple bands without a stone in them. At the same time, she began to notice a new habit among the town people. In the old days, one would meet a boy trifling with a girl under a hawthorn hedge frequently enough. Orlando had flicked many a couple with the tip of her whip and laughed and passed on. Now, all that was changed. Couples trudged and plodded in the middle of the road indissolubly linked together. The woman's right hand was invariably passed through the man's left and her fingers were firmly gripped by his. Often it was not till the horses' noses were on them that they budged, and then, 
though they moved it was all in one piece, heavily, to the side of the road. Orlando could only suppose that some new discovery had been made about the race, that they were somehow stuck together, couple after couple, but who had made it and when, she could not guess. It did not seem to be nature. She looked at the doves and the rabbits and the elk hounds and she could not see that nature had changed her ways or mended them, since the time of Elizabeth at least. There was no indissoluble alliance among the brutes that she could see. Could it be Queen Victoria then, or Lord Melbourne? Was it from them that the great discovery of marriage proceeded? Yet the Queen, she pondered, was said to be fond of dogs, and Lord Melbourne, she had heard, was said to be fond of women. It was strange it was distasteful, indeed, there was something in this indissolubility of bodies which was repugnant to her sense of decency and sanitation. Her ruminations, however, were accompanied by such a tingling and twanging of the afflicted finger that she could scarcely keep her ideas in order. They were languishing and ogling like a housemaid's fancies. They made her blush. There was nothing for it but to buy one of those ugly bands and wear it like the rest. This she did, slipping it, overcome with shame, upon her finger in the shadow of a curtain, but without avail. The tingling persisted more violently, more indignantly than ever. She did not sleep a wink that night. Next morning when she took up the pen to write, either she could think of nothing, and the pen made one large lacrimose blot after another, or it ampled off, more alarmingly still into mellifluous fluencies about early death and corruption, which were worse than no thinking at all. For it would seem her case proved it that we write, not with the fingers, but with the whole person. The nerve which controls the pen winds itself about every fiber of our being, threads the heart, pierces the liver. Though the seat of her trouble seemed to be the left hand, she could feel herself poisoned through and through, and was forced at length to consider the most desperate of remedies, which was to yield completely and submissively to the spirit of the age, and take a husband. That this was much against her natural temperament has been sufficiently made plain. When the sound of the Archduke's chariot wheels died away, the cry that rose to her lips was life. A lover. Not life. A husband. And it was in pursuit of this aim that she had gone to town and run about the world as has been shown in the previous chapter. Such is the indomitable nature of the spirit of the age, however, that it batters down anyone who tries to make stand against it far more effectually than those who bend its own way. Orlando had inclined herself naturally to the Elizabethan spirit, to the Restoration spirit, to the spirit of the 18th century, and had in consequence scarcely been aware of the change from one age to the other. But the spirit of the 19th century was antipathetic to her in the extreme. And thus it took her and broke her, and she was aware of her defeat at its hands as she had never been before. For it is probable that the human spirit has its place in time assigned to it, some are born of this age, some of that. And now that Orlando was grown a woman, a year or two past thirty indeed, the lines of her character were fixed, and to bend them the wrong way was intolerable. So she stood mournfully at the drawing room window, Bartholomew had so christened the library, dragged down by the weight of the crinoline in which she had submissively adopted. It was heavier and more drab than any dress she had yet worn. None had ever so impeded her movements. No longer could she stride through the garden with her dogs, or run lightly to the high mound and fling herself beneath the oak tree. Her skirts collected damp leaves and straw. The plumed hat tossed on the breeze. The thin shoes were quickly soaked and mud caked. Her muscles had lost their pliancy. She became nervous lest there should be robbers behind the wainscot and afraid, for the first time in her life, of ghosts in the corridors. All these things inclined her, step by step, to submit to the new discovery. Whether Queen Victoria's or another's, that each man and each woman has another allotted to it for life, whom it supports, by whom it is supported, till death them do part. It would be a comfort, she felt, to lean, to sit down. Yes, to lie down, never, never, never to get up again. Thus did the spirit work upon her, for all her past pride, and as she came sloping down the scale of emotion to this lowly and unaccustomed lodging place, those twangings and tinglings which had been so captious and so interrogative modulated into the sweetest melodies till it seemed as if angels were plucking harp strings with white fingers and her whole being was pervaded by a seraphic harmony. But whom could she lean upon? She asked that question of the wild autumn winds. For it was now October, and when as usual. Not the Archduke, he had married a very great lady and had hunted hares in Romania these many years now, nor Mr. M, he was become a Catholic, nor the Marquis of C, he made sacks in Botany Bay, nor the Lordo. He had long been food for fishes. One way or another, all her old cronies were gone now, and the Nels and the kids of Drury Lane, 
much though she favored them, scarcely did to lean upon. Whom, she asked, casting her eyes upon the revolving clouds, clasping her hands as she knelt on the window sill, and looking the very image of appealing womanhood as she did so, can I lean upon? Her words formed themselves, her hands clasped themselves, involuntarily, just as her pen had written of its own accord. It was not Orlando who spoke, but the spirit of the age. But whichever it was, nobody answered it. The rooks were tumbling pell-mell among the violet clouds of autumn. The rain had stopped at last and there was an iridescence in the sky which tempted her to put on her plumed hat and her little stringed shoes and stroll out before dinner. Everyone is mated except myself, she mused, as she trailed disconsolately across the courtyard. There were the rooks, canute and pippin even transitory as their alliances were, still each this evening seemed to have a partner. Whereas, I, who am mistress of it all, Orlando thought, glancing as she passed at the innumerable emblazoned windows of the hall, am single, am mateless, am alone. Such thoughts had never entered her head before. Now they bore her down unescapably. Instead of thrusting the gate open, she tapped with a gloved hand for the porter to unfasten it for her. One must lean on someone, she thought, if it is only on a porter, and half wished to stay behind and help him to grill his chop on a bucket of fiery coals, but was too timid to ask it. So she strayed out into the park alone, faltering at first and apprehensive lest there might be poachers or gamekeepers or even errant boys to marvel that a great lady should walk alone. At every step she glanced nervously lest some male form should be hiding behind a first bush or some savage cow be lowering its horns to toss her. But there were only the rooks flaunting in the sky. A steel blue plume from one of them fell among the heather. She loved wild bird's feathers. She had used to collect them as a boy. She picked it up and stuck it in her hat. The air blew upon her spirit somewhat and revived it. As the rooks went whirling and wheeling above her head and feather after feather fell gleaming through the purplish air, she followed them her long cloak floating behind her, over the moor, up the hill. She had not walked so far for years. Six feathers had she picked from the grass and drawn between her fingers and pressed to her lips to feel their smooth, glinting plumage, when she saw, gleaming on the hillside, a silver pool, mysterious as the lake into which Sir Bedivere flung the sword of Arthur. A single feather quivered in the air and fell into the middle of it. Then, some strange ecstasy came over her. Some wild notion she had of following the birds to the rim of the world and flinging herself on the spongy turf in their drinking forgetfulness, while the rook's hoarse laughter sounded over her. She quickened her pace, she ran, she tripped, the tough heather roots flung her to the ground. Her ankle was broken. She could not rise. But there she lay content. The scent of the bog myrtle in the meadow sweet was in her nostrils. The rook's hoarse laughter was in her ears. I have found my mate, she murmured. It is the moor. I am nature's bride, she whispered, giving herself in rapture to the cold embraces of the grass as she lay folded in her cloak in the hollow by the pool. Here will I lie. A feather fell upon her brow, I have found a greener laurel than the bay. My forehead will be cool always. These are wild birds' feathers the owls, the night jars. I shall dream wild dreams. My hands shall wear no wedding ring, she continued, slipping it from her finger. The roots shall twine about them. Ah! She sighed pressing her head luxuriously on its spongy pillow, I have sought happiness through many ages and not found it, fame and missed it, love and not known it, life and behold, death is better. I have known many men and many women, she continued, none have I understood. It is better that I should lie at peace here with only the sky above me as the gypsy told me years ago. That was in Turkey. And she looked straight up into the marvelous golden foam into which the clouds had churned themselves, and saw next moment a track in it and camels passing in single file through the rocky desert among clouds of red dust, and then, when the camels had passed, there were only mountains, very high and full of clefts and with pinnacles of rock, and she fancied she heard goat bells ringing in their passes, and in their folds were fields of irises and gentian. So the sky changed and her eyes slowly lowered themselves down and down till they came to the rain-darkened earth and saw the great hump of the South Downs, flowing in one wave along the coast, and where the land parted, there was the sea the sea with ships passing, and she fancied she heard a gun far out at sea, and thought at first, that's the Armada, and then thought no, it's Nelson, and then remembered how those wars were over and the ships were busy merchant ships, and the sails on the winding river were those of pleasure boats. She saw, too, cattle sprinkled on the dark fields, sheep and cows, and she saw the lights coming here and there in farmhouse windows, and lanterns moving among the cattle as the shepherd went his rounds and the cowmen. 
and then the lights went out and the stars rose and tangled themselves about the sky. Indeed, she was falling asleep with the wet feathers on her face and her ear pressed to the ground when she heard, deep within, some hammer on an anvil. Or was it a heart beating? Tick-tock, tick-tock, so it hammered. So it beat, the anvil, or the heart in the middle of the earth, until, as she listened, she thought it changed to the trot of the horse's hoofs. One, two, three, four, she counted, then she heard a stumble, then, as it came nearer and nearer, she could hear the crack of a twig and the suck of the wet bog in its hoofs. The horse was almost on her. She sat upright, towering dark against the yellow slashed sky of dawn, with the plovers rising and falling about him, she saw a man on horseback. He started. The horse stopped. Madam, the man cried, leaping to the ground, you were hurt. I'm dead, sir, she replied. A few minutes later, they became engaged. The morning after, as they sat at breakfast, he told her his name. It was Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, Esquire. I knew it, she said, for there was something romantic and chivalrous, passionate, melancholy, yet determined about him which went with the wild, dark-plumed name a name which had, in her mind, the steel-blue gleam of rook's wings, the hoarse laughter of their cause, the snake-like twisting descent of their feathers in a silver pool, and a thousand other things which will be described presently. Mine is Orlando, she said. He had guessed it. For if you see a ship in full sail coming with the sun on it proudly sweeping across the Mediterranean from the South Seas, one says at once, Orlando, he explained. In fact, though their acquaintance had been so short, they had guessed, as always happens between lovers, everything of any importance about each other in two seconds at the utmost, and it now remained only to fill in such unimportant details as what they were called, where they lived, and whether they were beggars or people of substance. He had a castle in the Hebrides, but it was ruined, he told her. Gannets feasted in the banqueting hall. He had been a soldier and a sailor, and had explored the east. He was on his way now to join his brig at Falmouth, but the wind had fallen and it was only when a gale blew from the southwest that he could put out to sea. Orlando looked hastily from the breakfast room window at the gilt leopard on the weather vane. Mercifully its tail pointed due east and was steady as a rock. Oh! Shell, don't leave me! She cried. I'm passionately in love with you, she said. No sooner had the words left her mouth than an awful suspicion rushed into both their minds simultaneously. You are a woman, Shell, she cried. You are a man, Orlando, he cried. Never was there such a scene of protestation and demonstration as then took place since the world began. When it was over and they were seated again she asked him, what was this talk of a southwest gale? Where was he bound for? For the horn, he said briefly and blushed. For a man had to blush as a woman had, only at rather different things, it was only by dint of great pressure on her side and the use of much intuition that she gathered that his life was spent in the most desperate and splendid of adventures which is to voyage round Cape Horn in the teeth of a gale. Masts had been snapped off, sails torn to ribbons, she had to drag the admission from him. Sometimes the ship had sunk, and he had been left the only survivor on a raft with a biscuit. It's about all a fellow can do nowadays, he said sheepishly, and helped himself to great spoonfuls of strawberry jam. The vision which she had thereupon of this boy, for he was little more, sucking peppermints, for which he had a passion, while the mast snapped and the stars reeled and he roared brief orders to cut this adrift. To heave that overboard, brought the tears to her eyes, tears, she noted. Of a finer flavor than any she had cried before, I am a woman, she thought, a real woman, at last. She thanked Bonthrop from the bottom of her heart for having given her this rare and unexpected delight. Had she not been lame in the left foot, she would have sat upon his knee. Shall, my darling, she began again, tell me. And so they talked two hours or more, perhaps about Cape Horn, perhaps not, and really it would profit little to write down what they said, for they knew each other so well that they could say anything. Which is tantamount to saying nothing, or saying such stupid, prosy things as how to cook an omelette or were to buy the best boots in London, things which have no luster taken from their setting, yet are positively of amazing beauty within it. For it has come about, by the wise economy of nature, that our modern spirit can almost dispense with language, the commonest expressions do, since no expressions do, hence the most ordinary conversation is often the most poetic, and the most poetic is precisely that which cannot be written down. For which reasons we leave a great blank here which must be taken to indicate that the space is filled to repletion. After some days more of this kind of talk. Orlando, 
my dearest, Shell was beginning, when there was a scuffling outside. And Basket the butler entered with the information that there was a couple of peelers downstairs with a warrant from the Queen. Show him up, said Shelmerdine briefly, as if on his own quarterdeck, taking up, by instinct, a stand with his hands behind him in front of the fireplace. Two officers in bottle green uniforms with truncheons at their hips then entered the room and stood at attention. Formalities being over, they gave into Orlando's own hands, as their commission was, a legal document of some very impressive sort, judging by the blobs of sealing wax, the ribbons, the oaths, and the signatures, which were all of the highest importance. Orlando ran her eyes through it and then, using the first finger of her right hand as pointer, read out the following facts as being most germane to the matter. The lawsuits are settled, she read out, some in my favor, as for example, others not. Turkish marriage annulled, I was ambassador in Constantinople, shall, she explained, children pronounced illegitimate, they said I had three sons by Pepita, a Spanish dancer. So they don't inherit, which is all to the good, sex? Ah. What about sex? My sex, she read out with some solemnity, is pronounced indisputably, and beyond the shadow of a doubt, what I was telling you a moment ago, shall? Female. The estates which are now desequestrated in perpetuity descend and are tailed and entailed upon the heirs male of my body, or in default of marriage but here she grew impatient with this legal verbiage, and said, but there won't be any default of marriage, nor of heirs either, so the rest can be taken as read. Whereupon she appended her own signature beneath Lord Palmerston's and entered from that moment into the undisturbed possession of her titles, her house, and her estate, which was now so much shrunk, for the cost of the lawsuits had been prodigious, that, though she was infinitely noble again, she was also excessively poor. When the result of the lawsuit was made known, and rumor flew much quicker than the telegraph which has supplanted it, the whole town was filled with rejoicings. Horses were put into carriages for the sole purpose of being taken out. Empty barouches and landaus were trundled up and down the high street incessantly. Addresses were read from the bull. Replies were made from the stag. The town was illuminated. Gold caskets were securely sealed in glass cases. Coins were well and duly laid under stones. Hospitals were founded. Red and sparrow clubs were inaugurated. Turkish women by the dozen were burnt in effigy in the marketplace, together with scores of peasant boys with the label I am a base pretender, lolling from their mouths. The Queen's cream-colored ponies were soon seen trotting up the avenue with a command to Orlando to dine and sleep at the castle, that very same night. Her table, as on a previous occasion, was snowed under with invitations from the Countess Sefar, Lady Q, Lady Palmerston, the Marchioness of P, Mrs. W. E. Gladstone and others, beseeching the pleasure of her company. Reminding her of ancient alliances between their family and her own, etc. all of which is properly enclosed in square brackets, as above for the good reason that a parenthesis it was without any importance in Orlando's life. She skipped it, to get on with the text. For when the bonfires were blazing in the marketplace, she was in the dark woods with Shelmerdine alone. So fine was the weather that the trees stretched their branches motionless above them, and if a leaf fell, it fell, spotted red and gold, so slowly that one could watch it for half an hour fluttering and falling till it came to rest at last, on Orlando's foot. Tell me, Mar, she would say. And here it must be explained, that when she called him by the first syllable of his first name, she was in a dreamy, amorous, acquiescent mood, domestic, languid a little, as if spiced logs were burning, and it was evening, yet not time to dress, and a thought wet perhaps outside, enough to make the leaves glisten. But a nightingale might be singing even so among the azaleas, two or three dogs barking at distant farms, a cock crowing all of which the reader should imagine in her voice, tell me, Mar, she would say about Cape Horn. Then Shelmerdine would make a little model on the ground of the Cape with twigs and dead leaves and an empty snail shell or two. Here's the north, he would say. There's the south. The wind's coming from hereabouts. Now the brig is sailing due west, we've just lowered the top boom mizzen, and so you see here, where this bit of grass is, she enters the current which you'll find marked where's my map and compasses, bosun? Ah. Thanks, that'll do, where the snail shell is. The current catches her on the starboard side, so we must rig the jaboom or we shall be carried to the larboard, which is where that beech leaf is, for you must understand my dear and so he would go on. And she would listen to every word, interpreting them rightly, so as to see, that is to say, without his having to tell her, the phosphorescence on the waves, the icicles clanking in the shrouds. 
how he went to the top of the mast in a gale, there reflected on the destiny of man, came down again, had a whiskey and soda, went on shore, was trapped by a black woman, repented, reasoned it out, read Pascal. Determined to write philosophy, bought a monkey, debated the true end of life, decided in favor of Cape Horn, and so on. All this and a thousand other things she understood him to say, and so when she replied, Yes, negras they are seductive, aren't they? He having told her that the supply of biscuits now gave out, he was surprised and delighted to find how well she had taken his meaning. Are you positive you aren't a man? He would ask anxiously, and she would echo. Can it be possible you're not a woman? And then they must put it to the proof without more ado. For each was so surprised at the quickness of the other's sympathy. And it was to each such a revelation that a woman could be as tolerant and free-spoken as a man, and a man as strange and subtle as a woman, that they had to put the matter to the proof at once. And so they would go on talking or rather, understanding, which has become the main art of speech in an age when words are growing daily so scanty in comparison with ideas that the biscuits ran out has to stand for kissing a negress in the dark when one has just read Bishop Barclay's philosophy for the tenth time. And from this it follows that only the most profound masters of style can tell the truth, and when one meets a simple one-syllable writer, one may conclude, without any doubt at all, that the poor man is lying. So they would talk, and then, when her feet were fairly covered with spotted autumn leaves, Orlando would rise and stroll away into the heart of the woods in solitude, leaving Bonthrop sitting there among the snail shells, making models of Cape Horn. Bonthrop, she would say, I'm off, and when she called him by his second name, Bonthrop, it should signify to the reader that she was in a solitary mood, felt them both as specks on a desert, was desirous only of meeting death by herself, for people die daily, die at dinner tables. Or like this, out of doors in the autumn woods, and with the bonfires blazing in Lady Palmerston or Lady Derby asking her out every night to dinner. The desire for death would overcome her, and so saying Bonthrop, she said in effect, I'm dead, and pushed her way as a spirit might through the specter pale beech trees. And so oared herself deep into solitude as if the little flicker of noise and movement were over and she were free now to take her way all of which the reader should hear in her voice when she said Bonthrop, and should also add, the better to illumine the word, that for him too the same word signified, mystically, separation and isolation and the disembodied pacing the deck of his brig in unfathomable seas. After some hours of death, suddenly a jay shrieked Shelmerdine, and stooping, she picked up one of those autumn crocuses which to some people signify that very word, and put it with the jay's feather that came tumbling blue through the beech woods, in her breast. Then she called Shelmerdine and the word went shooting this way and that way through the woods and struck him where he sat, making models out of snail shells in the grass. He saw her, and heard her coming to him with the crocus and the jay's feather in her breast, and cried Orlando, which meant, and it must be remembered that when bright colors like blue and yellow mix themselves in our eyes, some of it rubs off on our thoughts, first the bowing and swaying of bracken as if something were breaking through. Which proved to be a ship in full sail, heaving and tossing a little dreamily, rather as if she had a whole year of summer days to make her voyage in, and so the ship bears down, heaving this way, heaving that way. Nobly, indolently, and rides over the crest of this wave and sinks into the hollow of that one, and so, suddenly stands over you, who are in a little cockle shell of a boat, looking up at her with all her sails quivering, and then, behold, they drop all of a heap on deck as Orlando dropped now into the grass beside him. Eight or nine days had been spent thus, but on the 10th, which was the 26th of October, Orlando was lying in the bracken, while Shelmerdine recited Shelley, whose entire works he had by heart. When a leaf which had started to fall slowly enough from a treetop whipped briskly across Orlando's foot, a second leaf followed and then a third. Orlando shivered and turned pale. It was the wind. Shelmerdine but it would be more proper now to call him Bonthrop leapt to his feet. The wind. He cried. Together they ran through the woods, the wind plastering them with leaves as they ran, to the great court and through it and the little courts, frightened servants leaving their brooms and their saucepans to follow after till they reached the chapel, and there a scattering of lights was lit as fast as could be, one knocking over this bench, another snuffing out that taper. Bells were rung. People were summoned. At length there was Mr. Duper catching at the ends of his white tie and asking where was the prayer book. And they thrust Queen Mary's prayer book in his hands and he searched, hastily fluttering the pages, and said, Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine, and Lady Orlando, kneel down, and they knelt down. 
And now they were bright and now they were dark as the light and shadow came flying helter-skelter through the painted windows, and among the banging of innumerable doors and a sound like brass pots beating, the organ sounded, its growl coming loud and faint alternately. And Mr. Duper, who was grown a very old man, tried now to raise his voice above the uproar and could not be heard and then all was quiet for a moment, and one word it might be the jaws of death rang out clear, while all the estate servants kept pressing in with rakes and whips still in their hands to listen and some sang loud and others prayed. And now a bird was dashed against the pane, and now there was a clap of thunder, so that no one heard the word obey spoken or saw, except as a golden flash, the ring passed from hand to hand. All was movement and confusion. And up they rose with the organ booming and the lightning playing and the rain pouring, and the Lady Orlando, with her ring on her finger, went out into the court in her thin dress and held the swinging stirrup, for the horse was bitted and bridled and the foam was still on his flank. For her husband to mount, which he did with one bound, and the horse leapt forward in Orlando. Standing there, cried out Marmaduke Bonthrop Shelmerdine. And he answered her Orlando. And the words went dashing and circling like wild hawks together among the belfries and higher and higher, further and further, faster and faster they circled. Till they crashed and fell in a shower of fragments to the ground, and she went in. End of the chapter. Thank you. Thank you.